As Cold War tensions grew in the 1950s, the U.S. relied upon the U-2 high-altitude reconnaissance spy planes and reconnaissance balloons from its Genetrix program. But these tools, unable to surveil some of the darkest and furthest reaches deep within the USSR, did not provide enough aerial coverage to accurately determine Soviet military operations, movements, and capabilities. Instead, the U.S. was forced to reach even higher with its reconnaissance missions using their Keyhole series of satellites. Unlike modern digital spy satellites, the KH series relied on the use of physical film that had to be secretly jettisoned and returned to Earth. To keep the film out of enemy hands, each KH satellite utilized a simple but effective trick. When their missions were complete, the KH satellites dumped their top secret film into a re-entry capsule and dropped it back to Earth. If the fiery descent went to plan, the capsule would jettison its heat shield and a parachute would deploy. All that would be left was for an airplane to hook it in midair, some 60,000 feet above the ground. Corona, the startup. The U.S. government had been researching high-altitude reconnaissance technology since 1946, when the RAND project, a precursor to the RAND Corporation, began campaigning for its development. RAND researchers worked on project feedback to figure out how a satellite would even function, since it was an unknown technological concept at the time. By 1954, the United States Air Force accepted assertions by the RAND Corporation that the technology was of, quote, vital strategic interest to the United States. It officially established the U.S. satellite program, Corona. Corona was run at the behest of a small group of CIA, U.S. Air Force, Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, or DARPA, and private industry experts tasked with finding a way to provide broad imagery coverage of the USSR. The principal aim of the spy project was to identify Soviet missile launch sites and production facilities. Initially called Weapon System 117L, the program initially suffered from a lack of funding. It wasn't until the successful Soviet launches of their Sputnik satellites in 1957 that the U.S. dramatically increased its funding for the program and quickened the pace of spy satellite development efforts. President Dwight D. Eisenhower formally endorsed Corona in February 1958. To the public, it was known by its cover name, the Discoverer Program. The project began in earnest in 1959 at the Onizuka Air Force Station with an initial budget of $108 million, or $920 million today. By the end of 1959, the program had split into three distinct programs. The Discoverer and Samos programs focused on missions involving reconnaissance, while the Midas program provided an early version of missile warning capabilities. The budget ballooned in the aftermath of a 1960 incident in which a U-2 spy plane was shot down over Soviet airspace, much to the embarrassment of the U.S. Discoverer by another name. The first launches of the Corona program were announced by the U.S. Air Force as satellites in the Discoverer series. The Discoverer program was officially described as a satellite technology development effort. Discoverer 1, the first of 38 public launches, occurred on February 28, 1959, launched from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. It would be the world's first polar orbiting satellite. Discoverer 2 launched in April 1959 and was the first satellite to be stabilized in orbit in all three axes, rendering it capable of receiving maneuvering commands from Earth. It was also the first to successfully separate from its re-entry vehicle on command and send the vehicle back to Earth. Following Discoverer 38 in 1962, the Discoverer program was officially terminated, although in reality many more Corona satellite missions were undertaken. It was done under a veil of secrecy placed on all photographic surveillance missions and related test missions, for obvious reasons. After all, the Soviets were also denying at the time that they were using secret satellites to spy on the United States and its Western allies. Corona satellites captured images of nearly the entire globe, but the main objective was photographic surveillance of the USSR, as well as the then antagonistic People's Republic of China. Corona's technical aspects. When the Corona satellite camera was first used, 
it only had a resolution of about 40 feet. By the end of the program, the satellite camera had improved to a resolution of 6 feet. While impressive for the time, this pales in comparison to digital surveillance capabilities of today. The satellites were launched by a Thor booster rocket, an early version of a Delta rocket, aboard an Agena spacecraft. They relied on a pair of five-foot-long stereoscopic iTech cameras using 12-inch F5 triplet lenses with a 24-inch focal length. Later models also incorporated a third index camera for additional reference. The cameras were fed a special Eastman Kodak 70mm film that produced 170 lines per millimeter. That was more than three times the 50 lines per millimeter resolution that earlier World War II aerial photography could compose. The first Coronas carried a paltry 8,000 feet of film per camera. However, improvements in film chemistry and design reduced the material thickness, and researchers were eventually able to double the capacity. The cameras themselves underwent numerous upgrades over the years. Unlike today's digital cameras and satellites that store or transmit information immediately, the Corona used film that had to be ejected from the satellite and recovered before it could be viewed. How was that done? Once the camera had run through its full complement of film, it would eject the roll via a re-entry capsule designed by General Electric and known by the military as buckets. After the bucket discarded its heat shield at 60,000 feet above the Earth, it deployed a parachute that could be snatched up by a passing plane, usually Air Force cargo planes such as a C-119 or C-130 equipped with a claw hook. Alternatively, the capsule could land safely in the ocean where it would float for up to two days awaiting retrieval. If it wasn't retrieved within 48 hours, a salt plug at the bottom of the canister dissolved, sinking the bucket and ensuring the satellite photographs and technology would not make it into enemy hands. If the bucket was retrieved in time, the film was transported to Rochester, New York for processing at Eastman Kodak's Hawkeye facility. The keyhole, or KH designation, was used for all photographic reconnaissance satellites. The number following the KH designation indicated what type of camera system was used on the satellite. Early systems carried a single panoramic camera, while later systems carried two panoramic cameras, looking 30 degrees apart, with one looking forward, the other looking backward. Early systems operated with only a single bucket, while later systems were configured with two or more. Additionally, the fore and aft camera's films were packaged separately for missions that carried twin panoramic cameras. The program's first successful mid-air capture occurred in August 1960, when a canister of film dropped back through the atmosphere from Discoverer 14 and was recovered. A specially modified C-119 flying boxcar conducted this mid-air capture. That bucket delivered a trove of intelligence photos taken over Soviet territory. A successful spy program. By the end of the Corona program in 1972, 145 Corona satellites had flown and photographed around 750 million square miles, or nearly 2 billion square kilometers of Earth's surface. During its operational life, Corona collected more than 800,000 images in response to American national security requirements at the time. On average, individual images covered a geographic area on the Earth's surface of approximately 10 miles by 120 miles, or 16 by 193 kilometers. Corona also had sister programs, namely Argon for mapping imagery, and Lanyard, a short-lived program designed for higher quality imagery. Well, not always a success. Corona Mission 1005, launched on April 27, 1964, was an embarrassing failure. After only 350 camera operations, the film broke. Shortly after, the Agena spacecraft's power supply failed. The capsule also ignored signals to deboost and re-enter. The satellite's orbit naturally decayed and it eventually crashed into the jungle in Venezuela, 500 miles south of Caracas. Locals found a strange object that was marked with United States and secret. The entire bucket was dismantled, and photos of the capsule were printed in the local newspaper. CIA agents tried but failed to collect all the debris. 
After the incident, future Corona vehicles no longer carried classification markings. Instead, they carried a notice of reward for return in eight languages. A huge declassification. It was only in the 1990s that the world first learned about the existence of Corona. On February 24th, 1995, then Vice President Al Gore visited CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia to announce Executive Order 12951, signed by President Clinton. This ordered the release of all the corona, argon, and lanyard imagery to the public. Corona thus resulted in one of the largest declassification projects in American history. The peaceful side of spying. It was believed by both sides that spying was necessary to achieve and maintain peace between the two superpowers. For example, Vice President Gore would later state, quote, Satellite coverage gave us the confidence to pursue arms control agreements, agreements that eventually led to dramatic decreases in the number of nuclear weapons and their delivery systems. Gore, who became famous for his advocacy on climate change, also noted the unforeseen ecological benefit of satellites. As he put it, quote, Satellites recorded much more than the landscape of the Cold War. In the process of acquiring this priceless data, we recorded for future generations the environmental history of the Earth at least a decade before any country on this Earth launched any Earth resource satellites. Digging into the past from above. Images obtained from Corona missions were even able to reveal secrets of the ancient Middle East and Levant region. Researchers are now finding historical sites that vanished decades ago by mapping historical spy satellite images to recent aerial photos. Scientists and archaeologists are successfully using the Corona satellite's decades-old photos of the region to reconstruct archaeological sites that have since disappeared, whether erased by urbanization, agricultural expansion, or industrial growth. Yet, for all the openness due to the declassification of the Corona program, information on spy satellites after 1972 is virtually non-existent, save for a few photos taken by the KH-11 satellite that were leaked to Jane's Defense Weekly in 1985.